Open your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of John, chapter number 4. John, chapter number 4. For several weeks, I've been sharing with you different things that Jesus said, and I, for whatever reason, I just can't seem to get beyond that. In fact, there's no way humanly possible to to cover everything he said, and so... Uh, naturally, you have to leave a lot out, and it would take literally take years to try to cover everything Jesus said. But when I started, I wasn't really wasn't really sure exactly uh, what I would do. I knew my main purpose, I think, overall was to simply share with you regarding the importance of uh, of listening to what. Uh, the Lord says, because we've got a lot of folks today, we've got a lot of regular church attenders, you know, all across America, folks that attend church and sing songs, give money, but they never really listen to what Jesus said, and uh, there's not anything more important than that. If we know, if we believe, if we obey everything that Jesus says, everything else will take care of itself. But that begins with us being willing to listen. Now, since I don't want to get lost in all of the details of this story, I want to keep you focused on the main issues. And that's why we've talked about uh, back near the beginning, we talked about what Jesus said about the new birth. It doesn't get any more important than that. If you miss that, uh, everything else is meaningless until you've been born again. We talked about what Jesus said to his disciples, uh, those men that he called and sent into the world. We talked about uh, what Jesus said about our attitude, the Beatitude section of the Sermon on the Mount. We talked about last week what Jesus said about our influence, that we ought to be salt and light in this world. Well, today... I want you to think what Jesus said concerning the harvest. And our text begins here in chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 28. Now, this comes at the conclusion of the story of Christ and the Samaritan woman at the well. And from this story, we learn two important things. Number one, what Christ can do for you, and number two, what Christ can do through you. So I want you to think about those two things as we go through a part of this story. Verse number 28, And the woman then left her water pot. This is upon discovering Christ as the Messiah. She left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did is not... This the Christ. And then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. And therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereupon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. And we'll see later on in the message, verse 39, many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman. A few weeks ago, I mentioned what Jesus said to the disciples when he said, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. 
Now that explains what he wanted them to do, but he didn't stop there. We see that he also gives them an example of what it means to be a fisher of men. And I think John chapter number 4 is probably the best example of all of those that could be given. It's a story revolving around a Samaritan woman who meets Jesus at the well, and then she begins to spread the news that others were saved. I remember several years ago I preached a message entitled, Uh, reaching others like Jesus did. Reaching others like Jesus did. And I mentioned three things that he did in reaching this woman, and that is he manifested his love. I mean, if we don't do that, we don't have a chance in reaching people. He manifested his love toward her. Secondly, he met needs. Thirdly, he made the truth known. It takes all three of those, and we see them here in this story. Now, this is not a history lesson. And, and, and as I said a while ago, I don't want you to get lost in the details of the story. And believe me, there's so, there's so much here that we couldn't possibly, if I, if I preached to dark, I couldn't cover all of this. But, but it's important that we hit the highlights so you'll understand the circumstances. And we find that in the first six verses of this chapter here. Verse number four, here's the key to that section. It says concerning Christ, he must needs go through Samaria. Now that was not the regular route. Uh, because the Jews had nothing to do with the Samaritans and they hated each other. And so normally they would go out of their way, go any other way except to go through Samaria. So this was not the normal route, but this was the way that God had planned. He was on a divine mission that made it necessary for him to go that way. I've often said, you know, we're, listen, we are not discharged from duty because it's difficult or even dangerous. We have a responsibility and regardless of how difficult and dangerous it is, that's what we need to do. And Christ is living, as it were, with, with that sense of responsibility in mind. And he knows this is the Father's will that I go through Samaria and nothing was going to stop him from doing that. And it's important for all of us to learn the lesson to go the way that God is directing us because any time that we ignore what God says, any time we ignore the warnings that He's given here in the Bible, any time that we ignore the commandments that He has set forth, we're headed for trouble. We're on the wrong road, and we're going to end up getting hurt as a result of it. So that's the circumstances. He must needs go through there. There is a purpose. We know that if God is sending him there, then there's something about to happen. Well, we know, beginning in verse 7, we come to the second part of this story, and that has to do with the conversion of the woman. The conversion of the woman. Now, you know, I just get up here and ghibli talk about this woman meeting Jesus at the well. And, you know, uh, it was just so simple and so easy. But sometimes we miss the difficulties this woman faced. I mean, it wasn't as easy as you might imagine. You know, sometimes we'll say, well, I invited my neighbor to church and he came to church. And what do you know? He got saved the very first time he ever heard the gospel. You know, listen, that's happened before. It really has. But it's not that simple, not that cut and dried for a lot of people. A lot of times there are difficulties that are to be overcome before a person finds Christ as their Savior. Now, in her case, there's at least three things, three major stumbling blocks. Number one, there is a racial conflict. It says here in verse 7, she's a woman of Samaria. And so she's got everything going against her because the Samaritans were considered to be half-breed Jews. And that was, you know, in the mind of the of the pure-bred Jews, I mean, they are a special people. And indeed, they were in a manner of speaking. But that made them no better than anybody else simply because God had a different plan for them. 
if they would have ever awakened to the fact that God had chosen them as a special people, that they might be a light unto the Gentiles. That is, they might be a blessing. Remember what God said to Abraham? I'm going to bless you and I'm going to make you a blessing. Well, you know, after that, the Jews just got the mindset, you know, we're God's people and He's going to make us a blessing. And they forgot about the part of being a blessing to others. And so all of this hatred is now brewing between the Jews and the Samaritan. And this makes it difficult for this woman to have any interaction, you know, with the Jews with uh, and with Christ and with the disciples. And so she is a woman who is despised. Secondly... There is a, a problem in, in, in regards to her relationships, a calamity, if you will, because notice that the Lord points out you've had five husbands and you're living with a man that, that you're not married to. Now, you know, we can surmise as to exactly what might have happened. Somebody could guess, well, you know, I guess, you know, that all five of her husbands had died and, you know, and now she got disappointed and she shacked up with this guy, you know. Or you, you make all kinds of guesses like that, but it just might be she had five husbands and for whatever reason she left them, they left her. I don't know the details of that, but I'm telling you, when you've been through five marriages and you're living with someone that you're not married to, you got a problem. you got a problem. And, and so this woman has that difficulty to overcome. Then there's the matter of the religious confusion. I mean, the, the Samaritans were not irreligious. It's not that they had no religion at all. They certainly did. And, and I don't have time to go into details, but they even believed in some of the same things that the Jews believed in. So they had a religion, it's just a matter of them being wrong. And so here we have a conflict when it comes to religions. So here are all of these difficulties. But in spite of those things, we see that this woman makes the greatest discovery that anybody has ever made. Believe me, there have been a lot of great discoveries made over the years. I preached a sermon entitled, uh, the, the World's Greatest Discovery. And that's what it was about. And I listed about 10 or 12 great discoveries. But I can remember when I was a boy, when one of my good friends had died from polio uh, as a result of the complications from it. And uh, then Jonas Salk comes along, you know, and all of a sudden, boy, we've got a cure for polio. Wow, what a discovery that was. But there has never been any discovery to equal what this woman discovered at the well that day. As she engages in a conversation with Christ here, all of a sudden she discovers that He is the Messiah. Years ago in Bible college, I was teaching a class there related to evangelism. And, and I can remember teaching and using this as what I believe is the best example in the Bible for the matter of dealing with people and bringing people to Christ. And you just, just take it point by point and you see that he came to where she was. Don't you love Squire Parsons' song, He Came to Me? Wow. He came down to this earth. He came to where we are, you know. But beyond that, He didn't just come to the world in general. He comes to us by way of the revelation of God's Word, by the working of the Holy Spirit. Jesus went to her. Now, he could have put up a sign somewhere out there on the road that said First Baptist Church of Jerusalem. Anybody that wants to get saved and go to heaven, come on in, we'll tell you how. By the way, that's about the way a lot of churches are operating today. They think they've done, you know, their duty. They've fulfilled their responsibility by just putting up a sign out on the road somewhere and saying, you know, hey, we're open for business. Come on in. We'd love to tell you about Jesus. But he went to where she was. He conversed with her. He engaged her in the conversation, which, by the way, was, you know, very unusual. Not only her being a Samaritan, but she is a woman. Not only is she a woman, but she is a woman the other women probably didn't want anything to do with because she's sleeping with some guy she's not married to. 
And yet the Lord took time to converse with her. He confronted her about her sinfulness. He challenged her misconceptions. He clarified the issues, that is the questions that she had in her mind. He took time to answer those questions as it were. He countered her attempt at an evasion Because when she saw that she was caught on the horns of a dilemma, all of a sudden she is trying to get out of it, and I don't have time to explain all of it, but but the Lord wouldn't let go. He was like a bulldog, you might say, in, in, in his conversation with her, holding her feet to the fire and making her focus on the subject at hand, that she needed living water. And the one that she was talking to was the only one that could provide it. And he confirmed who he was. He convinced her of his truthfulness. And she received the message, accepted him as the Messiah. Now, you would think from that point on, everybody lives happily ever after. Wow, the disciples come back and they see her there and they are rejoicing, saying, praise the Lord. We we were hoping and praying that something like this would happen. There's been a breakthrough now with the Samaritans. Now that the Lord has reached her, maybe we can reach others. No such thing. They come back and they begin to criticize her. Now, I'd like to think that never happened, but it did. It reminds me that there are some folks who just find fault with absolutely everything. doesn't make any difference. First little thing that pops up they don't like, all of a sudden they're complaining about it. The disciples come back and say, why are you talking to her? Why are you, why, why are you engaged in a conversation with her? Don't you know she's a Samaritan? So all of a sudden, all of a sudden, she's being criticized. Now, I know they're, you know, probably not that loud and that vocal about it and whatever. They're talking amongst themselves. And, but the Lord knows what's going on in their heart. And that's all that matters. Now, while the Lord, now I want you to get this, while the Lord is correcting them. Well, let's look at verse number 28 and you'll see what I mean. I don't want to just skip over all of it. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? And then they went out of the city and came unto him. Now remember what's going on. The Lord is in the process of trying to correct the concept of these disciples that are criticizing her and in reality criticizing him for having something to do with her. So they're complaining. The Lord is correcting. And what's she doing? She's out there doing what they should have been doing. She's gone into town. And notice, she's saying to the men, men of the town. You you know, a lot of times we worry about women preachers. Now, now we all know what the Bible teaches about women preachers and the pastor being, you know, the husband of one wife and all of that. But I tell you, if it wasn't for some women speaking up in some places, there'd be a lot of churches closed. I've been in a lot of little old country churches where the men didn't have enough backbone to do get up and stand up and do what needed to be done. And thank God there were some women said, well, if nobody else would do it, I'll teach Sunday school. Uh, We don't have any women teaching adult men in our church here, but that's because we don't have to. we got some men that'll do it. So here we find these guys being critical and the Lord correcting them. And she's gone into the city and she says, Come see a man that told me all things that ever I did. You see, the Lord was speaking and she was listening. What Jesus said. And Jesus had a message for her. And she listened and she was transformed, and now she goes. Now remember, she doesn't have any training. She hasn't been off to Bible college. She hasn't received a degree of any kind in seminary. She's not been to a soul-winning clinic. She's never read the best-selling book on how to win souls to Christ. She's had no training whatsoever. She's had really no encouragement or anything. 
She just simply went and declared what she had discovered. And while the disciples were concerned about eating, she was concerned about feeding others spiritually. In other words, she was doing what they should have been doing. You know, they didn't come back and say, Boy, oh Lord, I'll tell you what, we had the best time in town. We stood on a street corner and we preached the gospel and we had 411 converts, you know. Man, we had a great time. You should have been there. It was wonderful. And, 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 and we're going to bring them all, all out here so they can meet you. They didn't come back with a report like that. They come back with a sack of McDonald hamburgers, you know, and said, hey, it's time to eat. And he said, oh, I've got meat to eat you don't know anything about. And they scratched their head and said, somebody already brought him something to eat? Well, they're talking about two different things, aren't they? They're trying to satisfy themselves. By, no, look, it's nothing, nothing sinful about eating. That, that's, that's a necessity, by the way. But eating or, or whatever it is, whether it's recreation or whatever it is, shouldn't ever get in the way of us doing what is most important. And this woman has made the discovery that I have found the Messiah. She goes into town and, and, and all of these men are following her out of town. Now, now comes the challenge. This gets down to the very heart of what we're talking about this morning. What Jesus said about the harvest. Notice in verse 34, he explained the desire of his heart. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Now remember, their attention's on physical things. And you know, I'm certain that they might have been sincere. They were concerned about whether he was eating properly or not. They're sincere. I don't see anything, you know, wrong with that. But their priorities are wrong. Jesus is focused on spiritual things and focused on doing the Father's will. He said, that's my meat. In other words, that's the thing that satisfies me. And then notice he expressed the fallacy of their reasoning. Look at verse 35, and I want you to pay close attention to every phrase here. Say not ye, now, now this is the question, and it's important that you understand that. It's not an accusation, it is a question. He says, say not ye, so, you know, it might have been, you know, like a proverb, something that they said often. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Now, that's evidently, you know, the assumed time from the sowing until the harvest. No doubt it was a phrase that they were all very familiar with. Isn't that what you generally say? There are four months and then comes the harvest? Well, they'd all have to agree with that. That's what they'd always heard and said. Behold, I say unto you, contrary to what you might have heard, he says, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields. Now, why did he say, lift up your eyes? You know, I've just, I've, I, I'm, I'm of the opinion that when they realized this woman had just, she had just done what they should have been doing, and the Lord has rebuked them, for being more interested in eating than in bringing others to Christ and so forth. I think they realize their mistake. I think they're, they've hung their head in shame. If they hadn't, they should have. I can see them standing there, you know, looking down at their toes and feeling guilty because this woman has embarrassed them with her zeal. So he says, lift up your eyes. Stop looking down. Look on the fields. I think there's more to it than just looking out there on a particular field of grain. Remember what we just read? Those Samaritans, the men, are following her out of the city. And whenever he says, look on the fields here, that, that was the field he's talking about. 
the Samaritans that are coming to investigate. And, and this is another way of him saying to them, just look on the fields. Look, look at those that this woman has reached. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields. And I notice the next phrase, for they are white already to harvest. Now we know that you plant the seed and originally it is green and then it turns a, you know, a, a brownish, yellowish, whatever, and ultimately it becomes light so that if you're standing in the distance and you look at it and the head of the grain, it's almost a whitish appearance. That might very well be exactly what he, you know, has in mind when he says that. But I don't know, the more I think about it when he said, uh, look on the fields, look at those Samaritans coming. And here they come, you know, with their, with their garments on, their turban and their robe. Here, here, here they come dressed in white. And he says, look out there. For they are white and ready to harvest. Now's the time. Not four months later. Now's the time. That, that's the point he was trying to drive home. You, you can't keep waiting until later when conditions are ideal. You, you can't, you know, you can't keep waiting until all of a sudden there's a peace treaty between the Jews and the Samaritans and they fall in love with you and they'll listen to you, you know. No, right now's the time. The harvest is ready right now. And then he expounds the nature and the benefits of Christian service there in verse 36. He that reapeth and receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. And goes on and elaborates on that. But aren't you glad that, that where there is a sowing, there will be a reaping? That, that's a universal law of nature. We reap what we sow. And he's reminding them, you know, he, 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 that, that you fellows are reaping something that somebody else has sown. He, no doubt, maybe he's talking about the ministry of John the Baptist, but I think more closely related, he's talking about this woman. Amen. This woman. Just, just look, what, look at those she has brought. And now here is this reaping. All of a sudden, here is one woman, never been trained, but she discovers who Christ is and makes it her mission to go into the city and to reach others. If we brought that up to our day, we might say she went back to the office. She went back to school the next day. Wherever it was, Wherever she would engage with other people, that is, they had, she had one thing on her mind, and that is to tell others, I have discovered the Messiah. Amen. You know, whenever he says in verse 38, I sent you to reap, that whereupon you bestowed no labor, other men labored and you are entered into their labor. You know, that must have hit them like a ton of bricks. It ought to get our attention also. Now look at verse 39. And here we see the converts. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on Him. Now don't stop reading. They believed on Him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them and abode there two days. Now get this, and many more believed because of his own word. Amen. You know, as we look around and consider the needs all around us, sometimes we're confronted with the question, can one person really make a difference? She did. Amen. She made a difference. Right. I'm convinced that we can make a difference if our priorities are right. And because of her testimony, notice many believe, but the story didn't end there. 
As a result of that, notice that the Samaritans persuaded Jesus to tarry with them and he hung out with those dirty, rotten sinners that nobody wanted anything to do with. He's hanging out with the Samaritans for two full days and then many more believed. You see what happens? She started a chain reaction. And I'm saying to you, we never know what great things might happen as a result of bringing one person to the Lord Jesus Christ. That there's just no telling what wonderful things might happen. Sometimes we look at some little toe-headed kid that comes in maybe on a church bus and torments the teachers and causes all kinds of problems and, and so forth. And maybe, maybe all of a sudden he makes a profession of faith and we think, well, good, maybe he'll settle down now. And we, you know, naturally we think that's a wonderful thing. The kid got saved, but we never realize what great things might happen as a result of that. Thank you, Daniel and uh, uh, Ethan or whoever it is that's helping you out with that van ministry. Thank God for that. To get out here. If you, listen, if you never bring anybody, just the effort you're putting forth every week, God will bless you as a result of that. He'll bless us as a result of that. And sometimes that, that one little kid that is saved as a result of a bus ministry, you never know what might happen. A kid might get saved, might surrender their life to preach, might go to a mission field. There's just no telling where it might end. All of these people now have been saved as a result of the testimony of one woman. You know, when I think about this church and yesterday there at the hospital and Looking around, at, uh, it was Adam and all of his, the rest of his family there, except Timmy, and and just being with them there during the hospital, and it just reminded me of the days that they were growing up. And then Laverne graduates and goes to heaven, and I get in the car and come over here, and and all of a sudden I look around and I I, I see those that have grown up in this church. And, and we had some here uh, that, that were visiting yesterday that had grown up in this church that had gone on uh, to other places now and what have you. But we look at our Awana ministry, our Sunday school ministry, and all of these different things. You know where those workers came from? They came from little kids that grew up in this church. Cherie, where'd Cherie go? She's somewhere out here doing something probably to help some way with the kids she started out picking her up on a bus one of our bus kids you, you see what i'm saying I, I want you this morning to go away realizing there is no telling what great things might that god might do through you but listen carefully and i'm through He'll not be able to do anything through you until you discover what He's done for you. And He certainly manifested His love, did He not? When our dear Savior died on the cross, when He paid our sin debt that we might be saved. Have you ever made that discovery? I was thinking the other day about, I've got it somewhere, I jotted down a little piece of paper, and I thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to preach someday on the story of my life. Not all of it, but I wouldn't tell you that, but I thought, I'm going to preach on the story of my life. And the first part is going to be, I was looking. That's the first part of my life. I was looking. I was looking for Jesus. But I didn't know who I was looking for. I was just looking. Just looking. The second part of my life is that I was looking at Jesus. And for all of these years since I've discovered the Lord as my Savior, you know, I'd been looking for Him or something that would satisfy, and He did. And I've been trying to keep my eyes on Him. So I've been looking at Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. But I'm also looking for Jesus. But the story doesn't end there. Someday I'm going to be looking at Jesus. 
And you see, what I'm saying is we need to look at the big picture. And whenever you consider what the Lord has done for you, and you've made that discovery that He's the Messiah, He's the one that has provided salvation, that God's not through with you just because He has saved you and just because you are assured of heaven. God has a work for you to do. If you're Listen, if, if you are not going to do anything to serve the Lord, there's no reason for you to remain on this earth. The same is true of me. If I just decide tomorrow, well, I'm through with this preaching stuff. I'm going to go whittle on a stick and, and drink sweet tea and spend my life, you know, fishing or whatever. There's no need me even being alive. None whatsoever. Amen. And, and you might be here today and it might be that you're older now than you've ever been. <laughs> yeah, you can figure that out. And it might be, it might be that you feel worse than you ever did. It might be that it's just like, wow, I just, I don't have an enemy. No, you can't do what you used to do. You can't. You're not able. But you can do something. There's something you can do. And that's why God has left you here. Let Him use you. That was really a simple thing, right? She just left the water pot, said enough of that. I ain't worried about the, somebody might have said, hey, hey, you left your water pot over there. Those things cost money. You better go back and get that. Somebody steal it. And she didn't care. She just left the water pot and took off for town telling everybody she could, I found the Messiah. I found the Messiah. Well, how do you know you found the Messiah? Because he told me all things ever I did. Remember how I started out in this question, this, this series? First message, I believe it was, was the a question from the one who has all of the answers. That's where we started. A question from the one who has all of the answers. She discovered, I, I, I found the one that's got all of the answers. And whatever your question is, I can tell you Jesus is the answer. Will you trust Him? Will you follow Him? Will you, will you let God use you to do what you can where you are while you can? Because we just got one shot at this. Let's not waste it. Stand with me, please. Father, how thankful we are that, that in spite of our sinfulness that you have, you have made a means whereby that we can escape damnation, a means whereby that our sins can be forgiven, that we can have a hope of heaven in our heart. And Lord, not only that we can look forward to heaven and the rejoicing that we will uh, will be able to do in that glorious day and think about all of the wonderful things, but Lord, we have this wonderful privilege of being able to share with others that just like I was, I was looking, that was the beginning of my life for all of those years, looking and never finding, because I really didn't know what I was looking for, till somebody told me about Jesus. And Heavenly Father, if there's someone here today, they're looking. That describes their life so far, they don't know they're looking for Jesus. They're looking for peace. They're looking for satisfaction. They're looking for hope. They're looking for that something that has eluded them all of these years. And I pray that you'll help them to see this morning that something is a someone. And that someone is Jesus. May they trust him today. For we pray in his name. Amen. While we